Um, this is not, of course, to state that um, a lack of globalization could cause human rights abuses, uh, but they give a number of reasons why this correlation could be found, and uh, I'll share a couple of them which I think are interesting. Uh, one of them is that multinationals uh, can be free of domestic prejudices, like uh, with Coca-Cola employing women where a domestic firm may choose not to, or uh, bringing jobs into an area uh, that's predominantly based around uh, discriminated minorities, uh, discriminated against minorities, I'm sorry. Um, Another one is that in many states where corruption is uh, very heavy and rife, an increased amount of wealth in non-state actors uh, can uh, weaken corruption and weaken the absolute state power, which makes human rights abuses much more difficult. Uh, finally, um, contract rich economies and for a country to be good for business, it must be legally very contract rich. Uh, protect uh, vulnerable populations from exploitation. Uh, one more thing, and this is just a personal speculation, uh, going back to what some of my colleagues have said, um, firms, large American multinationals are extremely image conscious. They're aware of how easy it is in the age of the internet to uh, bring attention of any bad behavior they have uh, into the public eye. And so with the whole world uh, becoming an increasingly globalized economy, I believe that they might um, uh, be in many ways reluctant to do business with um, various economies where they believe that they could end, find themselves in trouble for human rights abuses. Um, and if a country is wanting to draw business into uh, their economy, uh, that provides an incentive for them to respect international standards for human rights. Uh, thank you, that's our presentation. So now we're going to do a five minute break where each team will formulate a rebuttal and then each person will have two to three minutes to speak and present a counter argument to each side. So five minutes and we'll regroup. <laughs> So if we want to turn our attention back to the teams, um, the small business team is going to come back with their rebuttal and then we'll follow it with three members from the other team to refute their main arguments. So one of the points that I want to refute and touch upon is something that Daniel mentioned. He talked about how Walmart is making improvements with their environmental responsibility. And I want to talk about Walmart's responsibilities to its workers. One of the things that I looked at was a study done by UC Berkeley. And they basically studied the use of safety net programs by Walmart wage workers in California. And it, the cost of the taxpayers is roughly $86 million annually for Walmart wage workers' use of these safety net programs, such as Medi-Cal, food stamps, and subsidized housing. Uh, their average uh, wages are $10 per hour compared to the average of other retailers in California of $14 per hour. Uh, Walmart offers lower prices through their efficient distribution centers and um, they're leveraging over suppliers basically. Other retailers may not have these luxuries so in order to stay competitive with Walmart's prices they may have to break up unions take away employee benefits and lower wages. If other retailers in California followed suit with this, it would cost taxpayers an estimated 400 million annually for the increased supply of the use of safety net programs. Uh, on average, there's, there's been 50 openings of Walmart stores uh, in every state across the nation. And the retail wages drop an average of 10% as uh, new stores introduced into the state. Um, I think that sums up my point that I wanted to make.
Right. Uh, I would like to touch upon a few points made uh, in terms of long-term community development uh, that was discussed uh, by Angela, I believe. Um, small businesses, by their very nature, are long-term community development. Um, they stay within a community, obviously, because they are physically grounded in that local community, and as such, they can't lift off and go to a different location quite as easily as uh, large multinational corporations can do, as we've seen not only in uh, foreign countries, but also in uh, parts of the United States that have experienced uh, economic stagnation as a result of the financial crisis. Uh, many large businesses have closed up. Uh, many branches in some large businesses, uh, for example, uh, Circuit City, let's say, uh, has left many very large, strange shaped red buildings around the country. Um, and another point that was made had to do with charities and, cause and uh, causes and the fact that large businesses can contribute a lot of money to these charities and causes. And uh, had these companies actually paid uh, their taxes, there may have been less of a need for these uh, charities and causes, um, as the government, um, whose purview it actually is to provide, f to provide for the poor and the sick um, and, the un un and the less fortunate, um, would have been able to actually afford to give, uh, to give money to these causes as opposed to having to um, engage in pretty ridiculous budget deficit battles. Um, and a point that Daniel made, I think, uh, regarding large companies supporting local farms uh, by buying up all the organic produce, that also um, eliminates a lot of smaller buyers that would like to be able to buy produce, uh, such as CSAs or smaller grocery stores that are unable to uh, compete with the rates uh, offered by these large corporations. Um, and I think Daniel also made a point about risk aversion, uh, small firms being risk averse uh, towards investments, and that was something that I had earlier contradicted uh, talking about clusters. And uh, usually, uh, not usually, um, in some cases, um, the risks taken by large businesses can obviously be too big, as we saw in 2008. Um, one last point was that uh, AT&T created an, an infrastructure and a network that enabled the United States to uh, become more centralized. Uh, however, AT&T was a monopoly that had to be broken up because it was engaging in some pretty shady practices. And um, I believe that's it. Thank you. Okay. I'd just like to make a few small points. Um, one, you guys said that large businesses have larger research and development budgets, but that necessarily isn't always a good thing. As cited with actually Microsoft, the Microsoft Office division was often competing against other research and development clusters within the company and taking most of the investment money, shutting out other forms of research and development within the country. You uh, mentioned railroad uh, b industry in the beginning age of America as a great thing for big business. However, railroads were actually the basis of the antitrust legislation I mentioned in my presentation, pretty much contradicting the benefits you brought up. Um, when it comes to the environment, big businesses lobby against um, environmental changes that will cost them money as seen as how the United States is no longer part of the Kyoto Protocol. And um, the risks that big businesses also are allowed to take often can be very dangerous on social welfare as seen as large businesses can invest in the housing bubble and we see how that has popped and affected social welfare. And you guys said yourself that Walmart only makes changes for profit, and when they make a change, it has an impact. However, they lobby against change that they don't want to do because it goes against making profit. And they can also use their power to change certain laws. Like, Walmart is the largest supermarket for organic produce. However, they have lobbied to change the laws of what organic even means. Um, the, and you guys hailed Boeing as a great employee in America. However, Boeing is part of the military industrial complex that I described in my presentation are actually involved of propelling our uh, nation of war and building industry of weapons. Um, you guys talked about positive standards they can set and also the positive spillover effects, but you failed to mention the negative standards and negative spillover effects that large businesses have when they go abroad. I feel that you used a naive interpretation, Tom, of what neoliberalism has around the world. And as you can see in the Middle East, South America, and in Central and Eastern Europe, especially Egypt and Tunisia, which were lauded as successes just months before the revolution, that people there are starving and they don't have work, and that's due to neoliberalism policy. So all in all, while many of your benefits are true, I don't feel that they go far enough to show that in Actuality, big businesses are actually using their power to work against social welfare. Well, 
Uh, I'm tempted to use these three minutes and just talk about Walmart, but I was afraid that would happen because th that's just what occurs all the time when we're talking about monopolies and it's getting boring at this point. I mean, at the point I brought them up is because it's not all bad and that they can promote social welfare just like Boeing does, although they might be proud of a military industrial um, complex. And, you know, I didn't, I wasn't able, you know, our team wasn't able to mention all the, uh, the disadvantages and bad things about di big business because, and I mean, they're there, of course, but we also promote social welfare. Um, and uh, the point with the railroad, and, and I just want to drive this a little further, was um, that, you know, you're arguing the organizational problems that come along with hierarchy and the big and the organization of big business, but that was also crucial to how our economy grew, um, you know, with mass production and mass distribution. You know, we, we wouldn't be here without big business, is what I'm arguing. And that, and, um, and bureaucracy actually does play an important role as well. Um, and there's a, there's a reason that, you know, big businesses have grown. And, and they're subject to regulation. Um, and, and that's, you're right, there is a role that the government needs to play, um, like AT&T. But AT&T still did wire the nation. Okay, if they became a monopoly. And so what if the railroads created antitrust regulation? That's necessary because, you know, there are problems, you know, that arise from all, tor uh, all types of uh, organizations. So that's one point I wanted to make. Um, the other point I wanted to address was the clusters. Um, I, I, I'm not entirely sure um, and understand what clusters are, but I think I get a clue. And um, First of all, I've never really come across too many. That could be my own fault. None of us really have. Um, but I will say that it seems like there could be way too many interests playing um, for one. And that's a lot of times what happened you know, when we looked at building networks um, that are crucial for the economy, like the, the telegraph or the, um, or, um, the uh, t um, railroad. Um, also, you, know, you gave uh, technology as an um, example. Well, I, I didn't hear any other examples, and I'm curious to know some more because technology doesn't demand uh, large amounts of capital for the most part until it gets really big. Um, technology, there's there's tons of startup firms, and that's great. But a lot, you, there's not too many startup and, and business clusters um, uh, in the auto industry or, or or big manufacturing industries um, like Boeing um, that uh, and GE. There, it, it's tough to have uh, clusters making airplane engines, um, and um, also um, regarding the the problem with um, people at the bottom of the structure um, in the organizations. Well, big businesses are also often subject to unions. Walmart is an example, and that's definitely a problem. But Walmart has been making some changes, too. And they make, they're, they're raising their wages, and they can offer certain benefits and have, and have increased that recently. And, um, the, and big businesses are subject to unions, like UPS, when a lot of smaller, um, smaller businesses are not. So it's difficult to make changes and, and enforce them as well. Um, so those are some points I wanted to address, and I'll turn now to Angela, to, uh, not Angela, I'm sorry, to Laura, no, to Thomas, who's going to follow up. Thank you. Great. Um, so uh, as far as uh, talk about uh, response to small companies being more productive, and also in uh, part to what my friend was saying here about uh, my view of neoliberalism. Uh, or at least my debate position on neoliberalism. Um, I'd like to point out that uh, multinational corporations are in many ways responsible for uh, improving productivity in developing countries where domestic policies may prevent maximum productivity and higher wages. Uh, when in Free Trade Under Fire, uh, Douglas A. Irwin wrote that in 1998, a, the general population in Vietnam had a disposable income of about 205 US dollars per year. Whereas people working in foreign-owned businesses owned, uh, earned about uh, 420 U.S. dollars per year. In addition, the poverty rates for those working in multinationals were only a quarter of the level of the general population. Uh, wages are strongly related to productivity, and productivity is very poor in underdeveloped countries, largely as a result of domestic policies. Uh, multinationals have the infrastructure need, uh, necessary to establish a viable business in an underdeveloped uh, country, and multinationals are one vehicle um, for providing productivity. 